Good afternoon, Valery Viktorovich. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, dear viewers, audio listeners, and comrades in the studio. Today is May 27, 2024. The first question from Grigory. Valery Viktorovich, the discussion about Ilian doesn't seem to be fading. Can you provide your thoughts on the recent video report by the SPAS TV channel focusing on the rehabilitation of Ivan Ilyin, as well as the publication of Ilyin's 1948 article, on fascism, on a religious website related to orthodoxy? The Russian Orthodox Church's official website also references Ilyin, etc. And, again, he continues, when discussing fascism, Ilian, and the Russian State University for the Humanities, those who justify Ilian's ideas often pose a strong argument, including a question. Putin quotes Ilian, do you want to call Putin a fascist? Please explain why Putin is quoting Ilian because now it is being used against him. Ultimately, what is the significance of all this? Let's address the final question first and then delve into the essence of the ongoing events surrounding Ilian. As the head of state, Putin cannot ignore the balance of power among the clan corporate groupings that make up Russia's administrative core. He must have a certain influence on them. The quotes used by Putin's speechwriters regarding Ilian are not problematic. It is hard to disagree with some of the messages conveyed by Ilian that were echoed in Putin's speech, especially if you are a patriot, you will agree with them. The goal was to promote, through Putin's positive image and selective quoting, the very image of Ilian. Now we are faced with the question of whether the state can exist without ideology and what kind of ideology it should have. This issue is currently being resolved. The whole scandal surrounding the Ilian Center reveals what Russia's future might look like, whether it will be independent, sovereign, or somehow subordinate to supranational governance. The scandal, as it is now abundantly clear, was instigated by the fascists. They chose opponents for themselves so that later someone who is not well versed in politics or philosophy, especially political matters, would be asked, shame on you. Look, these scoundrels and lowlifes are against Ilian. Are you on their side? Then what kind of Russian patriot are you? This would naturally confuse the person, leading them to respond, what do you mean? How could I be on their side? But the point is that this way the essence of Ilian's entire creation, its content, and its conceptual essence are being hidden, and the thought is being smuggled in. If there are such scoundrels against him, then he's probably a good person. However, this is actually the mindset of the average person, as illustrated in the movie, Office Romance. What do you think of these boots? Too flashy. I'll take them. In other words, if someone you dislike says, look how terrible it is, then it must be a good thing. This is exactly the logic employed to promote fascism. 
что касается вдруг неожиданного и что церковь поучаствовала. Regarding the sudden involvement of the church, the asker observed several minor events, which have been numerous. Lately, various media outlets have been broadcasting programs that praise Ilian to different extents, with the church playing a significant role. Церковь здесь отнюдь не последнюю роль играет. Что касается вот э, на, э, на сайте, э, как там сказано-то, э, на ресурсе религиозного характера э, опубликовано. Так, э, In relation to Ilian's article published on a religious website, there is a particular church that has housed Ilian's library for an extended period. Так что все там как бы понимают и все движется туда, куда надо. Потому что руководство РПЦ даже не заметило, что годами... All parties involved are aware of the situation, and things are progressing as expected because the leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church did not even notice the years of fascist propaganda on the website of this church. И здесь сразу возникает такой вопрос. А кто курирует? In this regard, the question that immediately arises is, who is overseeing and protecting the Ilian Center? Почему? Why can't it be closed down? Почему? Даже выводят и рассмотрение то, что Ильин why is it not even considered that Ilian is the original founder of, so to speak, Russian fascism? It was he who was the ideological guru who shaped the ideology of the Roa. Да, он уже в сорок первом году узнал, что Германия погибнет. Он прекрасно понимал, что все. In 1941, he already knew that Germany would lose and understood that since they did not take Moscow and the hope for a coup d'état failed, Russia would survive at any cost. Но он по-прежнему надеялся причинить России максимальный ущерб, чтобы максимально However, he still hoped to cause maximum damage to Russia to remove any obstacles to building fascism. This week, the so-called mega-resources have come to Ilian's defense, and practically all those heavyweight individuals who protect Ilian have exposed themselves. Это, безусловно, последний бесогон э, так, Михалкова, где он, ну, вот, понимаете? Without a doubt, this is Mikhalkov's latest Bisagon program, where there is sheer distortion and lies just to praise Ilian. Are we now being led to believe that we fought for the ideals of fascism during the Great Patriotic War? Weren't we fighting against fascism? No. Тут надо понять. Прежде всего, а является ли First and foremost, it is important to determine if Ilian is a philosopher in the true sense. To avoid making our own interpretations, we will rely on the statements made by the person who heads the center named after Ilian, which I have previously quoted. Let's revisit this brief yet important information. In 2011, Alexander Gelievich Dugin released the book, Martin Heidegger, The Possibility of Russian Philosophy. Русский патриотизм на прусский манер. 
Ivan Ilyin, Russian Patriotism in the Prussian Style. In the philosopher Ivan Ilyin, we encounter an almost caricatured attempt to create a bravura version of Russian nationalism, successfully bypassing any important and significant topics that are fundamental to clarifying the possibility of Russian philosophy. Instead, he replaces questioning and identifying pain points with a stream of right-wing conservative consciousness, copying the clichés of European nationalism in relation to Russian society. The kind of society that Ivan Ilyin writes about while in exile has never existed, does not exist, and cannot exist. We are talking about a normative Prussian fantasy that aims to present Russia as a clearly working social mechanism of the German type. As a result of this construction, all content of any significance for Russia falls out of sight for Ilyin. Ilyin, carefully and mediocrely, mechanically reproduces Russian nationalism, patriotism, and gallant monarchism, managing to ignore all the meaningful aspects of Russian history that are unfolding before his eyes, with his participation and with his help. Since there is nothing Russian in such purely German official thinking, Anyone who has studied Ilyin's work, if they are honest, will agree with these words. Ilyin's entire philosophy is built solely on an emotional basis, and it lacks a conceptual understanding of Russian culture and the Russian people. His goal was to steer Russia towards fascism, as he stated directly in 1948 that fascism cannot be imposed on the Russian people without changing their culture. This directly aligns with what Dugin has said. But we know that Dugin heads the center named after Ilyin. There is a mystery here. How is this possible? Maybe Dugin reconsidered his position on Ilyin, and this is reflected somewhere in him? However, in 2021, a reissue of this very book, Martin Heidegger, comes out, and there is a characterization of Ilyin as a person who cannot be considered a philosopher at all. Then, on August 27, 2023, Dugin heads the Ilian Center, and for him, Ilian is already an unconditional philosopher. But in the two years between 2021 and 2023, there must have been something indicating a change in Dugan's perception of Ilian? Somehow this shift must have happened? And, in principle, such a shift has emerged. Around this time, Dugin began to talk about the inferiority of geopolitics, finding flaws here and there. He started openly critiquing the so-called science of geopolitics, which is a playground for political figures to distract them from power players who govern the globe, allowing those state functionaries to play in the sandbox of geopolitics. So Dugan initiated such discussions. Then, on August 20, 2022, a terrorist attack occurred, resulting in the death of Alexander Gelibich Dugan's daughter. A great tragedy, a profound grief.
И вот здесь произошел слом Дугина. Уже через год он... This event caused Dugin to have a breakdown, and a year later, he views Ilian as a philosopher and heads his center. Он смирился. He has accepted the fact that his master, who appointed him to head the center, murdered his daughter. The reasons behind this act and his motivations are his burden to bear. Nevertheless, his perspective shifted drastically following his daughter's death. He quickly understood the situation and how his master was correcting him. Without a smooth transition and without writing anything new, he immediately publicly acknowledges Ilian as a remarkable philosopher whose ideas he actively promotes. We often state that fascism is an anti-human ideology. In fact, it is one of the types of culture of public self-government, only possible in a crowd, elite, society. Fascism can be built on any ideology. There is a film called, Sideburns, where fascism is built on the works of Pushkin. And, I will repeat the definition, the essence of fascism, regardless of what it is called, the ideas it hides behind, and how it exercises power in society, is the active support by the crowd of, little people, according to their ideological conviction, of the system of abuse of power by the, elite, oligarchy. This, elite, oligarchy presents unrighteousness as supposedly true righteousness and, based on this distortion of truth, manipulates people's worldview. With all its power, it cultivates unrighteousness in society, hindering people from reaching their humanity. The same oligarchy, under various pretexts, uses all its power to suppress anyone who doubts the righteousness of itself and the policies it is pursuing as well as those whom it merely suspects of doing so. This is the essence of fascism. And now let's revisit the argument. Are you against Ilian when Putin himself quotes him? Shut up! Don't have your own opinion. This is fascism. Or is the head of state incapable of making mistakes? Of course not. In a recent confirmation of the government, the new Minister of Defense, Belisov, emphasized that his guiding principle is, you can make mistakes, but you must not lie. This is the main thing. If we disregard the mistakes, can we also assume that there is a political maneuver by the head of state among clan corporate groups? Or does this phenomenon not exist in Russia? Or maybe we should reflect on the events of the 1990s. Let's examine how heads of state maneuver between clan corporate groups in other countries, such as the United States. How does Trump maneuver, and how does Biden maneuver? The approach seems to be similar across different countries. Based on this, if Putin addresses society using a cult figure who is revered by a particular clan group, he fits that clan group into activities that benefit the state. Of course, 
However, he does not advocate for life to be based on the philosophy of Ilyin himself, who had aspirations of introducing fascism in Russia and regretted, until his death in 1954, that Hitler could not win. Ilyin was reflecting on why Hitler had not achieved victory. He viewed May 9 as a day of mourning, while June 22 was a day of victory, joy, and happiness for him, marking the onset of trouble for Russia. These sentiments are evident in his writings. If we were to extract all words about fascism from all texts, Ilyin's work would primarily consist of emotional statements about Russia, which are considered by some as well-meaning idiocies. Some would see these emotional statements as attractive and correct. However, this is not an argument because for some, Manilov's fantasies seemed correct, which had their own audience. But in this situation, the misguided notions expressed by Ilyin did not align with Russian culture and were more reflective of Prussian culture. Some may argue, these ideas are truly Russian. Truly? Maybe they are Prussian? It is important to differentiate between what pertains to Russia and what pertains to Prussia and Germany. The aforementioned Mikhalkov claims, he was persecuted in Germany for being pro-Russian. In reality, he was not persecuted for his pro-Russian views. He portrayed himself as a victim when he was dismissed from Germany and relocated to Switzerland. He faced typical workplace competition when his deputy took over his job, not because of his pro-Russian stance. He worked in Goebbels' department and performed well. <coughs> Even after being dismissed from the institute, Goebbels' department, he continued to receive a salary from the department until 1938. He then moved to Switzerland at the expense of the Third Reich, with furniture. Poor guy. It was for a specific reason that I read the definition of fascism. What is that? This week, a significant event occurred that exemplified fascism in its true form, aligning perfectly with the definition. In the State Duma, Deputy Denis Parfionov from the Communist Party of the Russian Federation spoke against the creation of the Ilian Center. He quoted Ilian himself without any deviations. It's important to note that the Communist Party of the Russian Federation is a Trotskyist party, not a communist one, and it has nothing to do with Bolshevism, despite their attempts to take credit for the Bolsheviks' achievements. Повлияло на содержательную сторону и изложение 
Parfionov's speech was largely driven by the party's PR agenda, which influenced the content and delivery of his arguments. However, the points he raised were valid. State Duma Chairman Volodin objected to Parfionov and spoke out no less than Parfionov. What did he say? First, don't divide society. Wait a minute. Who is dividing society? With all my attitude towards the Communist Party of the Russian Federation and Parfionov, was it the Communist Party of the Russian Federation that threw in an idea that is completely unacceptable in society, the inculcation of fascism? No, the fascists did it. If Volodin truly seeks to unite society, he should address the fascists, such as Dugin and everyone who protects him, and say, the Russian people have suffered huge losses in the fight against fascism. The idea of fascism is deeply contrary to Russian culture, as even Ilyin himself admitted. The country is currently at war. Why are you disrupting society by creating this center and promoting fascism? While the Russian people are fighting on the front lines under the red banner, there are those within society committing treason under the white-blue-red tricolor, aiming to undermine governance and ultimately bring about the downfall of Russia as a sovereign power. If, during the Great Patriotic War, engaging in the propaganda of fascism had been allowed and the Ilian Center had been created in Moscow in exactly the same way, it would have been complete nonsense and would have seemed simply impossible. According to Mikhalkov's narrative in Bisagon, we should credit Ilian for the victory over fascism. He attributes the triumph not to Stalin, the Bolshevik Communist Party, or the Russian people, who suffered huge losses, but to the fascist Ilian, claiming that we vanquished the fascists because of him. This logic is fundamentally perverted. And this is precisely presenting unrighteousness as supposedly true righteousness. It would have been more appropriate for Volodin to address these fascists, saying, are you patriots? Then shut up. Calm down in the country, and then we can have normal discussions. Instead, he says to Parfionov, you are labeling him as a fascist. Parfionov responds, I just quoted. Ilyin defined himself that way. What does Volodin answer? In a purely fascist spirit, what right do you, redneck, have to draw conclusions about what you read? We have the right people who will interpret it for you and tell you how to understand it. You do not have the right to draw these conclusions yourself. Wow! This is pure fascism in its refined form. Volodin revealed himself to be a true fascist in his speech.
We will share the full speech on our Telegram channel and vContacta, so you can listen to it yourself. He actually shifts the blame onto someone else's shoulders. The fascists started a scandal that was most dangerous for the life of the state, and then they say, and you will accept it. You don't want the state to fall, do you? Therefore, as the fascists said, so it will be. But you yourself do not dare to understand what is written in these works. We have the right people who will interpret it correctly and tell you how to understand it correctly. You have no right to make your own opinion about what you read. The question arises, is he the only one? Volodin didn't want to be the only fascist, so he quickly turned to another person, the vice chairman of the state Duma, Tolstoy. Tolstoy also confirmed that he was a fascist. He had no choice but to confirm it, as the master didn't allow any other response. He could have taken a different approach and stated that he doesn't support fascism, that the fascists initiated the discussion, that it should be stopped to prevent societal division, and that the majority of people are against fascism. However, he twisted Parfionov's words and supported Volodin, turning it into a game of two passes. The Communist Party of the Russian Federation has a pattern of behavior where they bring up important topics only to discredit them and move on. This is also seen in their approach to issues like the red state flag and many other issues. For example, they have been known to walk out of budget approval sessions when budgets do not align with the people's interests. We'll just leave the hall, and you pass this budget. Ultimately, it turned out that all budgets were approved in favor of the oligarchs. Therefore, the Communist Party's claims of fighting for the people's interests have always been mere imitation. And the same pattern is evident in this situation. There is a push to halt public debates on fascism. A full-scale attack is in progress. They want to eradicate all resistance in order to influence the people. Look, Putin is quoting Ilyin. Ilyin speaks such good words about Russia, remaining silent about fascism in Ilyin's works, planning to cultivate it quietly and shape the Russian mob to conform to a new culture that embraces fascism. This was the essence of Volodin's address. So, did Ilyin say something good? Yes. Can it be used? Yes. However, in life, there are situations where you find yourself in a confrontational relationship with someone, and suddenly that person speaks out against your adversary. The Western model is, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yet, common human logic, also reflected in Russian culture, which explains our strong rejection of fascism, is captured in a proverb, for example, from the Swahili people, because the crocodile ate my enemy, he did not become my friend. Just because Ilyin said something good about Russia while simultaneously working towards its destruction and reformation in a Prussian style, he does not become a friend.
This is a common tactic used by scammers, who initially flatter individuals and then proceed to mislead them with false stories and words that cater to their desires. Ilyin operates using this tactic. It is just necessary to read his works. If someone truly wanted to properly evaluate Ilian, they should have held a roundtable discussion before starting this scandal and silencing everyone. Ilian's defenders, who are fascists that hate the Russian people, would have come together with anti-fascists to discuss Ilian's works. Only after deciding that his beliefs were acceptable for Russia would it be necessary to say, yes, if Ilian stands for fascism, then this is acceptable. But isn't this what we see being introduced into society now? What else is crucial in the mass media right now, amidst the ongoing battle against fascism? This situation has been ongoing for a while and continues to shape a media narrative that favors fascism. What am I referring to? I'm referring to the white guard cycle of songs. It is not a secret that Ilyin himself and white movement leaders have discussed in their memoirs that the white guard movement and fascism are essentially the same. Let me remind you, the White Guards fought to divide Russia into colonial possessions of the intervening states, as Churchill candidly noted. That is how he was, he wrote everything directly. And no one has refuted this. Moreover, when the issue of Russia repaying the debts of the White Guards to Western states, the interventionist countries, arose, Soviet Russia issued its own counter-invoice, showing, why on earth should those who came here to destroy receive payments from Russia? What did you pay the White Guards for? For your politics. Here are the documents. The publication of, Who is the Debtor, shed light on this, prompting the West to acknowledge Russia's stance. Okay, okay, that's it. Well, of course. We just wanted to conquer Russia and turn it into a colony, but Russia defended herself. And even in the logic of the West, why should Russia pay if it has won? The White Guards fought exactly for the goal of making Russia a colony. Currently, a large number of songs from the White Guard cycle are being broadcast on television, featuring lyrics advocating for the destruction of the Red Bastard, just for the destruction of the Red Bastard. These songs incite hatred. However, these red bastards, despite coming from a backward, illiterate country, rose to become a superpower, journeyed into space, pioneered the peaceful atom, and defeated fascism. Defeated fascism. This is what they cannot forgive and call them, red bastards. The songs themselves are of poor quality, with simplistic music and amateurish poetry, yet they are being broadcast repeatedly.
This is the first step to introduce fascism in Russia, reminiscent of the 1990s when the blame was shifted from the true enemies of Russia, Hitler and the SS Wehrmacht, who had invaded and killed Russian people, towards Stalin and the Bolsheviks, who created a sovereign country, the number one superpower. However, in this way, as a result of a coup d'état, the sovereign red flag was replaced with the tricolor, symbolizing Russia's colonial dependence. A full-scale attack is in progress. Push fascism through, suppress all dissent, and silence any opposition. Look, Ilyin is speaking good words about Russia, he's a good individual. He is being quoted by Putin. Shut up, everyone. There should be no alternative understanding. As for Ilyin's views on fascism, there's nothing to it. You can't equate him with Hitler in terms of ideology. How can he not be equated with Hitler? You should delve into Ilyin's writings, particularly, Hitler's strategic mistakes. If you can't read everything, at least read this piece, it's concise and accessible. But no, everything is censored and distorted. Fascism is being introduced in the country. The question that arises is whether we should confront this issue now, during a time of war, or not. Lately, several generals have been arrested. While it may seem unnecessary to target the generals while the army is engaged in battle, if their actions jeopardize the army's effectiveness and the overall defense capabilities of the country and harm the army in the cause of victory over global fascism in confrontation with the entire collective West, then what should be done? Let them do harm? Is it worth fighting against spies? Should we allow them to pass on information and engage in sabotage, or should we take action to counter their activities now? The fact is that stakes are much higher when it comes to ideology. Missing one opportunity to counter the threat could have severe consequences. This is why all anti-fascist forces are currently being suppressed. We just discussed the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. The Communist Party of the Russian Federation recently held a plenum. They started it with bravado, stating that they are against fascism and all that. However, I don't see the results of the discussion on fascism. All other topics are in place, but fascism is not, it is censored. Are they playing it safe again? It was possible to take a serious stance, but they are instead playing it safe to avoid standing out. This is because a complete introduction of fascism is underway. Those studying the conception of public safety are observing this example of the inculcation of fascism in the events surrounding the conception of public safety. Look at how the conceptual essence of the works released by the internal predictor of the USSR group has changed after they registered copyrights for themselves, in violation of the internal predictor of the USSR's copyright, they have registered copyrights for themselves. What did they start? Instead of Sobernost, they now advocate for the Mafia. Instead of implementing their own conception, they claim, the global predictor allocated a small zone for the internal predictor of the USSR. If the global predictor punishes within the internal predictor of the USSR zone, it is just and must be endured. Therefore, in whose jurisdiction do we register copyrights? British. The master is there. The same fascist logic and governance culture is evident, where there should be an elite, and the rest, you, Bulgan and Nikolai, as they order, so you bay. That's the essence of it all. A full-scale attack is underway across all fronts and social class levels of society.
The attack is intensifying, and it is crucial that we resist and fight fascism with unwavering determination. We must not be influenced by their narratives. Losing the battle in Moscow would mean losing the entire country that the fascists do not need. Let me remind you that their holiday is on June 22nd, while their day of mourning is on May 9th, as stated in their manifesto, which I have also quoted. This is the situation. One more question. People are asking for your comment on the statement made by the British Defense Secretary Shapps in an interview with Sky News, where he stated, We are in an existential battle about the way we run the world order, therefore, we have to stand up to autocratic states. What is your response to this? This sentiment aligns with our previous discussion. In the eyes of the West, fascism represents a natural self-governance culture, making Russia their enemy due to the presence of Bolshevism in Russia. The two essences, fascism and Bolshevism, are fundamentally incompatible. Therefore, they have set the goal of destroying Russia altogether. Consequently, in a natural way, they support all fascist processes within Russia and create a certain image. Yes, the West adopted a negative stance towards fascism after the victory in World War II. But what are they doing? They introduced the new concept of Russism as a means to destroy Russia, with internal traders working towards establishing fascism within the country. Yes, the question currently being resolved is, who will be the governance concentration center around the globe? Previously, the global predictor held this role. The situation would have been more favorable if the global predictor had been the one fighting against Russia in this war. However, in this war, the collective West is fighting against Russia under the supranational governance of the United States, marking a significant difference. The United States does not understand what it is doing. They do not feel responsible for the entire planet, putting civilization on the brink of a global nuclear catastrophe. They are willing to push civilization to the brink without considering the consequences, as long as they believe there will be no retaliation from Russia. However, the global predictors globalists understand that Russia will not hesitate to respond, as the Russian people are not like their elite. Therefore, the GP globalists are seeking an agreement with Russia on new terms. They are saying, you are establishing fascism inside Russia, and in exchange, you will be our new global policeman instead of the United States. Our elite responds, wow, great. We will be the master's favorite wife. Do we feel sorry for Russian guys? Tomorrow we will sort out everyone in Africa, Latin America, and somewhere in New Caledonia, we will crush everyone. We're not some Americans. However, this would require the establishment of fascism, a goal that the Ilian Center is working towards. The global predictor is concerned about the potential for a global civilizational catastrophe because there is no backup planet available. If the United States leads the world into this catastrophe, there will be no turning back. Why could they? The reason is the presence of pro-American lackey elites within Russia. 
Вот только ленивый на Западе не высказался, что Россия не ответит ни на один удар со стороны Запада. As a result of their actions, now only the lazy in the West have not spoken out that Russia will not respond to any Western attacks because the Rus Zion elite is hesitant to harm their Western master. Two years of the special military operation for demilitarization and denazification have highlighted this behavior. If the Rus Zion elite had acted differently, the conflict in Ukraine could have been resolved quickly in 2022, followed by a military police operation to eliminate Bandera gangs all at once. Some would have fled to Canada, and hell with them, in any case, everything would have settled down by now. However, a full-scale war against Russia is desired to weaken the country, while the global predictor needs to gain control over Russia, hence the imposition of fascism. It is crucial to avoid this war at all costs. How can we prevent this war? Essentially, the West is not eager to engage in war. But, seeing that Russia is not even fighting with half-hearted effort but rather with one hand and not even giving their full effort, they became insolent to the limit. The aforementioned Minister of Defense said that London prefers not to directly confront Russia. Why would it? There are Ukrainians available for this purpose, and there is Eastern Europe available for this purpose. And, as if by command, Poland and the three Baltic failed states quickly pledged their troops to fight against Russia. Why? These countries lack sovereignty and simply follow orders. The outcome for their countries is of little concern to them. Slaves. Similarly, our pro-American lackey, elite, are also slaves. The situation is that. Look here, Putin, of course, walks a fine line when he touches upon negotiations. He often expresses willingness to engage in negotiations while repeatedly saying, where is the legitimacy? Where are the guarantees? Well, look, they violated here, they violated there. He actually says that there is neither a topic nor a party for negotiations. How does the West respond to all peace initiatives? They increase their attacks on Russia. When Kyiv asks for the opportunity to use American weapons to their maximum range across Russian territory, they are not implying that the Ukrainians will launch these weapons. The case is that all American weapons are directed by American drones and satellites and are only launched from Ukrainian territory. Statements by Stoltenberg, Ukrainian figures, and U.S. figures are part of an inter-clan dialogue within the U.S. elite to influence Pentagon decisions on expanding the range of targeting in Russian territory. However, the West only carries out strikes because Russia is hesitant to cause any harm to the United States or tarnish its reputation. The Houthis, on the other hand, are fearless. They recently shot down their sixth Reaper drone this week. In the span of just four months, six Reaper drones have been taken down, whether the United States likes it or not. Despite the U.S. retaliating with missile strikes, their ammunition has depleted. They are still taking action, but their resources are dwindling. Under these conditions, how dare our slaves and lackeys demonstrate the incapacity of the United States? Are you crazy? 
How does Nabialina speak? She claimed, Russia may collapse, and the world will survive. However, if the United States collapses, it will be a problem. Therefore, we must bring down Russia and save the United States. So what? Maybe she was punished? Maybe she was somehow restricted? No. The two idiots who constantly look into her eyes, Orishkin and Reshetnikov, only wish for the destruction of Russia. While I have only mentioned these two individuals, there are many others. She receives support from various clan, elite, groups, and they all dream of fascism, of reaching an agreement, and of becoming a global policeman. When discussing the battle for the right to govern the world order, it is not about winning on the battlefield. The global predictor does not need to escalate the war, especially into Europe. If a war erupts, the Intermarium project will collapse, a long-term project that does not align with the establishment of a European Islamic Caliphate. Furthermore, expanding the war into Europe and Russia would result in the demise of civilization on Earth. They do not desire this outcome. Therefore, it is much simpler for the global predictors globalists to implement fascism in Russia as a form of self-governing societal culture, a form of fascism that is repugnant to Russian culture. This is also part of the front. Shaps actually alluded to this. Since they cannot defeat Russia on the battlefield, as everyone has already acknowledged and their resources are depleted, Russia is developing, and at all costs, she will be victorious. They need to pursue a different approach. What did they do in the First World War, when victory was already within reach? The Allies orchestrated the February Revolution in Russia, leading to the collapse of the state. Presently, the state cannot collapse. However, why not introduce fascism? Let's promote fascism under the guise of patriotism. Then, Russia's victory on the battlefield becomes inconsequential, and Russia will be our monkey, pulling roasted chestnuts out of the fire. This is the situation. That's all the questions for today. Well, all that remains for me is to say goodbye and remind you that many things are incomprehensible to us, not because our concepts are weak, but because these things are not in the circle of our concepts. Modern humans simply need to know how complex social supersystems and states are governed. Such knowledge is only provided in one source, the works of the internal predictor of the USSR. For the current complex and powerful maneuver, we have published in advance the three-volume set, War State Bolshevism, where we provide an understanding of what a state is, explain what war is, and offer a way out of this chaos. The solution lies in Russian Bolshevism. Another book was published titled, State Symbols and State Sovereignty. We often receive questions such as, what does this country's statement mean? Why did it happen this way? Look at the flag, and you will understand the level of sovereignty of this state, how it is governed, and the place it occupies in the hierarchy of states. We wrote about all of this. Our partners have released a collection of analytical notes titled, Fleet is Being. 
It not only expands the understanding of the issues presented in the three-volume set, War State Bolshevism, but it is also still useful today. The collection addresses questions about the central bank, the S institution, and more. These topics are laid out in separate analytical notes, exploring why Nabialina acts in a certain way and not otherwise and why the head of state can act in a certain way and not otherwise. This week, 20 congressmen spoke out in favor of shutting down the Federal Reserve System. And for what reason? During a dialogue with FRS Chair Powell, a direct, specific question was asked, can the president fire you? No. If not, then it is necessary to close such a mechanism that is not accountable to the state. According to our constitution, the central bank is independent from state subordination. It serves as an instrument of supranational governance. Currently, it is not the global predictor utilizing this tool of supranational governance, it is being used by the American national elite for their own purposes. So, this collection of analytical notes not only expands and complements the three-volume set, War State Bolshevism, but also includes individual works that are relevant right now. It can be read as a separate book. Another book that can also be read as a standalone volume is an additional volume to the three-volume, War State Bolshevism, series published by our partners. We are preparing the third edition of the three-volume set, but the timeline for its release is unknown. However, our partners have already published new materials as a separate book, and there are also independent works that can be used individually. This means that you can purchase it not only as a supplement to the first and second editions of the three-volume set, but you can also acquire it as a standalone work. The book addresses issues such as army size, drill training, which are currently not quite adequately considered, and other related topics. Our partners publish the Library of Conceptual Knowledge series. The book on economics has been published. The book on imitative and provocative activities has been published. The book Sufficiently General Theory of Governance has been published. This is the backbone of the conception of public safety. Oh yes, Pushkin, about the conceptual content of Pushkin's work. The matrix is different from the matrix, is about how matrix governance is carried out. All of these books and others can be read to understand current issues. Therefore, study them, become conceptually powerful, and, on that basis, protect the interests of yourself and your family in your everyday life. By doing so, you will ensure the prosperity of the state and guarantee a bright, happy future for your children. I wish you a peaceful sky above your head. Happiness. See you next time.